Two months back, we shipped a few pre-production SLS printers to a bunch of content creators to put them through their paces. Some things rocked, others not so much. So today we're diving into what we are going to change to make them better. Stick around to the end of the video because we've got some exciting stretch goals and of course thoughts on Scotty's feedback. Oh, and by the way, it was absolutely awesome meeting so many of you at Open Sauce last week. First, I think it would be helpful to look at the performance of the machine objectively. We are not trying to downplay the things that didn't work, those are real issues, but we also think it's too easy for the negatives to overshadow the positives. Just because one person had a dead on arrival printer does not automatically invalidate others that have had positive experiences. Five of the machines we have sent out have been tested so far, more videos coming soon, which revealed that certain components like the auger have some issues, while others like the powder flipper and FDM printed sift bin need a more thorough overhaul. However, it's also crucial to highlight where we excelled. The most complex part of the entire printer, the optic system, worked without a hitch. From the laser source and optics to the Galvo system with its custom driver, the main board and firmware, even the printer's UI, everything operated seamlessly together. Our slicer, another intricate part of our setup developed entirely from scratch, also worked with minimal issues. And when the prints work, they're exactly as shown in our videos. And we're not hiding the fact that print failures occur. They do on ours, but that's true even on the most high-end machines. What sets us apart is our algorithm-based print failure detection which successfully identified and aborted 100% of problematic prints before they could wreak havoc or break the printer. Now, let's dive into the main changes we're implementing, starting with the auger. Basically, it all comes down to clearance. Early on, we had issues with powder leaking back down the auger when the auger wasn't rotating. Our first thought? The clearance between the auger and the tube was too generous, leading to this leakage. By tightening this gap, we managed to solve the problem somewhat, which led us to move on, thinking it's solved. However, we later uncovered the true culprit, which is the auger's inlet was too restrictive. This caused the powder to be lifted faster than it could be replenished. After addressing this, we kept the original auger configuration as it performed well in our tests. Nonetheless, we didn't foresee how shipping impacts could affect the printer, and indeed, one of the five machines experienced an auger jam. To fix this, we simply need to increase the clearance. Additionally, we've modified the control board to allow the motor to reverse for minor jams. While tapping the auger with a hammer might seem silly, it did resolve lighter jams. As the saying goes, always start with the simplest solution. Let's move on to the powder flipper, a critical component that has given us quite a bit of headache. Here's how it works. The auger lifts powder, which is then evenly spread across the width of the build area by the flipper's rotation before being lifted to the build surface. When we first noticed recoat failures, our gut reaction was to blame the gear driving the powder flipper, thinking it was skipping. But digging deeper, we uncovered a sneakier issue. During longer print jobs, some powder particles were getting in between the shaft and the bushings, causing the flipper to bind and fail to lift the powder. This led to the printer detecting a recoat fault and stopping the print. While it might seem like a trivial oversight, it's precisely these kinds of problems that beta testing is meant to catch. To tackle this, we've come up with a straightforward redesign for the bushings. The new design will incorporate partial slots that are designed to let any trapped powder escape while still keeping a full circle front face that acts as a barrier to minimize further powder ingress without adding unnecessary resistance. These bushings are made with powder metallurgy and the custom dies for them are surprisingly affordable. All right, let's address the elephant in the room, the sift bin. Yes, the structural integrity of it is absolutely terrible in its current state, and we are really sorry for everyone who has had it crack and make a mess. There are two main culprits. One is how we pack them for shipping, and the other is the walls that are too thin for their own good. In an effort to cut down on the shipping cost, we placed the heavy powder bottle inside of the bin, which, surprise surprise, led to cracks during transport. Moreover, when you're shaking it with heavy parts inside, those parts banging against those thin walls also led to further damages. For now, we are beefing up the wall thicknesses and adding sheet metal inserts to better distribute the impact loads, and of course, shipping the powder bottles separately. We were all set to show off the improved bin in today's video, fresh off our trip from open sauce. But as luck would have it, our journey back to Madison hit a snag. 
The A320 that we were supposed to be on broke and our flight got delayed, stranding us with an unexpected overnight layover in Dallas. And just when we finally got back on Tuesday and thought we were out of the woods, our FDM printer's hot end threw a tantrum. Swapping it out with a spare didn't do the trick, so we'll keep you updated on this. Looking ahead, we're also looking at other manufacturing options, like reaction injection molding, or maybe just going full send and buying a proper injection mold. That would be one of our stretch goals. But at the end of the day, the SIF bin is essentially a fancy bucket with a mesh in the middle. Plenty of companies can make these for us, and we are already in talks with them to ensure that what we deliver is not just functional, but durable. And yes, we are definitely going to improve our packaging, not just for the bin, but for the entire printer and its components. Another topic that has been on many of your minds is safety. Let's set the record straight. This is definitely not a living room printer. We still don't recommend setting it up in your bedroom or right next to your desk. Keep it away from your working and living spaces. However, most of the mess you've seen in the videos is largely due to the sift bin breaking, which, as I mentioned earlier, we're on track to fixing. The current sift bin, when it's not broken, is actually watertight. We've also found that our instructions were not as clear as they could be, which led to some confusion about the correct post-processing steps to minimize powder spill. Again, this is why we are user testing and will be improving. First, the powder cake should never be lifted out without the scoop in place. Also, whenever you open the lid after shaking the bin, make sure the dust extractor is running to prevent dust plumes. When manually brushing the parts, installing the glass plate will help you achieve the necessary airflow. And about our dust extractor, it might look dinky, but don't let its size fool you. It's got a HEPA filter and really strong fans that move a ton of air, which is why it's so super hot. For added safety, we recommend wearing an N95 mask in case of accidental spills, which is actually more than the recommendations from Evonik, the world's largest supplier of PA12 powder. You may have seen videos of people wearing full PPE suits with positive pressure respirator, but if you look closely, those are actually metal 3D printers, where the powder is actually toxic. An N95 respirator when handling SLS nylon is the industry standard. Of course, the printer is also equipped with a built-in carbon HEPA filter, and we will be conducting a full air quality analysis to make sure it complies with the relevant standards before we ship you the machines. Hey everyone, Henry here. You might have seen Scotty's video on his secondary channel, Stranger Parts, and here's our half of the story. Firstly, the issues that Scotty mentioned are real, and we are actively working on them. We admit that a lot of these are our oversight, and we take full responsibility. But we never asked for Scotty to hide any of the issues, nor did we ask any of the other creators to do so. We also never asked for the video to be delayed until after Kickstarter, contrary to what was claimed. Dates they've suggested are all either at the end of the Kickstarter or after the Kickstarter ends. If you guys are unaware, you can cancel your Kickstarter pledge anytime you want. There's no point for us to trick you into pledging when you can just back out before the campaign ends. Releasing the video a week or two later might even give it more visibility since it won't be competing with all the other videos. Transparency is everything to us. We've shared detailed videos on not just how the printer works, but how we built it, answer all your questions on Discord, offered print service to showcase our printer's parts, came to open source with a live demo, and now made this video. The part about us asking for the printer back because, quote, we felt our hard work was not appreciated, was taken out of context. And claiming that we want the printer back because the review is negative is just plain false. This message is where it all went downhill when he told us, I've already put a lot more time into this than I planned, and I have other projects I need to work on. Take a moment and imagine if you were us. You spent the last two and a half years working 70, 80 hour weeks with no weekends or holidays, waking up in the middle of the night from metal shavings, and now practically living in the lab. Building everything from the lasers, to the control boards, to the powder system, to the interface, and of course the entire slicer completely from scratch. All just trying to make a tightly integrated product and make SLS more accessible. You then send the results of all this work to somebody free of charge, where you just sat in the corner for a week and a half.
When issues arise, you immediately offer replacement parts. Then you get a message that sounds like they are fed up with it, and another one saying they don't have time to wait for the replacement parts. Throughout this entire collaboration, we have been extremely proactive. We've offered help with setting up the printer, sent free additional printing materials, hopped on support calls at any time of the day, and reached out actively to see if there is anything we can do to help, just to be left on red. We asked for more time because we didn't want the auger issue, which was immediately fixed after installing the replacement part by the way, to take up almost half the video and be the only thing anybody ever talks about regarding the printer. So yeah, we treated Scotty in the same way that we treated anybody else. We are just two regular guys and we've done the absolute best we can. Take from it what you will. And there we have it, the things we are going to change to make Micron better and more user friendly. We've added stretch goals to our Kickstarter which is live right now, so check it out in the link below. And as always, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell, join us on Discord, and if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below.